and I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. Welcome to Thriller Vault. Tonight I have the story of O.J. Simpson and the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. This is a story you've likely heard, but you might not have heard this story from O.J.'s perspective. After O.J. was acquitted in 1995, the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson filed a civil lawsuit against him. In February of 1997, a civil jury unanimously found Simpson liable for the wrongful death and battery against Goldman and battery against Brown. O.J. Simpson was ordered to pay $33.5 million in damages. O.J.'s net worth at the time was $11 million. He paid the Goldman family $500,000 from the auction of his Heisman Trophy and other valuables, but O.J. moved to Florida and started a business in the name of his kids to avoid paying the settlement. In 2006, 12 years after Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman were stabbed to death, O.J. Simpson wrote a book with the help of a ghostwriter. The publisher only agreed to produce the book because they believed the book would contain an admission of guilt for Nicole and Ron's murders. O.J. Simpson refused to directly admit that he committed the murders, but he did talk about the murders in hypothetical terms. The publisher and many others felt that this was a confession, most notably the Goldman family. When the Goldman family initially found out about O.J.'s impending book, they sought to block the publication, not wanting O.J. to profit from the pain he had caused. But they eventually changed their tune, believing that the book was a confession that should be published. So they fought in court to take possession of the book as partial payment for the tens of millions of dollars that O.J. still owed them. The Goldman family was eventually awarded the book. The title, If I Did It, remained, but the cover was cleverly constructed, the if in the title barely visible. The story of O.J. Simpson's perspective is primarily derived from If I Did It. Quick disclaimer, I have edited, paraphrased, and made this into a story. Some minor details may be speculation and or fiction, but the main details are true according to O.J. Simpson's own words as told to the ghostwriter. Here is the confession. My name's Orenthal James Simpson. Most people know me as O.J. Chances are you think you know me. I'm the most infamous suspected murderer in the history of the world. But you don't know me, and you don't know what happened. I know what happened in 1994 when my ex-wife Nicole and her friend Ron Goldman were killed. I know all the players, all the details, and we're going to get to that. But I'm not just this infamous person. Before all this mess, I was a pretty damn good football player and a very successful guy. I won the Heisman Trophy at USC, an award given to the best college football player. In the NFL, I won the AFC MVP three times. I was a five-time All-Pro. To this day, I'm the only player ever to run for 2,000 yards in a 14-game schedule. I was so good that I became a college and an NFL Hall of Famer. After I retired from football, I became a football analyst for NBC. I did some acting and I was in some commercials. You might remember my Hertz ads with me running through the airport, jumping over luggage, late for a flight. But I assume you're not here for all that. You want to know about me and Nicole. Someone told me once that all stories are love stories. And this story ain't no different. It's a love story, all right. One with a tragic ending. In the summer of 1977, I was married to my first wife, Marguerite. We were coming up on our 10th wedding anniversary, but our marriage wasn't doing too well. We had separated at one point, but we were trying to make it work for our two kids. Then, in the middle of dinner, Marguerite tells me it's not working. But that wasn't all. She was five months pregnant, too. I knew our marriage was on the rocks, but I was shocked about the pregnancy. Our youngest child would be born into a broken home. The next day, I told Marguerite I was going to the mountains to think things through. On my way out of town, I ran into a friend, and we had breakfast at the Daisy. Our waitress was gorgeous, blonde, slim, with a smile that could bring a man to his knees. Who are you? I asked. Nicole, she replied. That was how I met my future wife, Nicole Brown. At the time, she was only a month past her 18th birthday. I was 30, with two kids, a wife, and another on the way. I didn't think I was going to do anything with Nicole. I went to the mountains, and I thought about my failing marriage. But I kept thinking about Nicole. 
I couldn't get her out of my mind. When I got back from the mountains, I wasn't any clearer on my marriage other than I knew it wasn't going to work. I went back to the Daisy, and I was honest with Nicole. I told her I was married, but my marriage was ending. We went to a party that night, and after that, I was hooked. For the next month, I spent every single day with Nicole. I ended up getting a room at the Marquis. I was living two lives. I was the estranged husband and father of three kids, and I was seeing Nicole at the hotel or her apartment. I eventually moved out of the hotel and into my friend Robert Kardashian's house in the Hollywood Hills. I asked Nicole to move in with me. I eventually introduced Nicole to my kids, and they really liked her. 1979 was a tumultuous year for me. My one-year-old baby girl, Aaron, fell into the pool and drowned. Also, my divorce with Marguerite was finalized, and she moved out of my Rockingham house. I was going to put the place on the market, but Nicole loved it and wanted to redecorate. We were in love. We were happy. Mostly. But Nicole was getting antsy. She wanted to get married. She was constantly on my case saying stuff like, Don't you love me? Don't we have a future together? When are we going to have children? These comments often led to arguments, and Nicole had a serious temper. I would just leave when she got crazy and come back after she cooled off. We finally got engaged in 1983, but that didn't stop the pressure. She wanted a marriage date, and she wanted kids. I loved Nicole. I really did. But she could be a real pain in the ass. In 1984, we were having another argument. I went outside to get away from her craziness. We had a tether ball hanging from one of the trees. There was a baseball bat nearby, and I started hitting the ball with the bat, just releasing a little steam, you know? Nicole comes outside, and she's glaring at me. And I glared right back at her. Then I flipped the bat into the air, and when it fell, it hit the rim of her Mercedes. Technically, it was my Mercedes that I bought for her. She said, You gonna pay for that? I said, Yeah. Then I grabbed the bat and smacked the hood and said, I guess I'll have to pay for that too, since it's my car, and I pay for everything around here. Despite our heated arguments, we loved each other, and we got married in February of 1985 at our Rockingham house. We had a band and a big tent over the tennis court and 300 friends. Everyone had such a great time that most of our guests stayed until sunrise. A few days later, we went to Mexico for our honeymoon. We made love three times a day. That was what we were there for, right? Six weeks after we got back, Nicole found out she was pregnant. She was beyond happy. She was glowing. Sydney Brooks Simpson was born on October 17th. Nicole was a great mother. She doted on Sydney, too much if you ask me. I couldn't even get Nicole to leave the house. She was so damn protective of Sydney. A few years later, in August of 1988, our son, Justin Ryan, was born. I looked at my second family, and I felt complete. We had a mostly storybook marriage. We had our share of arguments, though. After Justin was born, Nicole started getting physical with me, coming at me with fists and feet. I usually tried to get out of her way but sometimes I had to hold her down until she calmed down. During the trial in 1994, the prosecution said they'd found handwritten notes from Nicole in a safe deposit box, alleging abuse by me. The notes were ugly, and they were bullshit. They said that I was constantly telling Nicole she was fat. They said that when Nicole got pregnant with Justin, I told her I didn't want another kid. They said I locked her in a wine closet when we got into an argument. I don't remember what else was on those notes, but there were a bunch of notes. It was all bullshit, though. We had a volatile relationship, but I only got physical with her one time, and that was New Year's Eve, 1989. We were at a party, hanging out with Marcus Allen, my old football buddy, and his girlfriend, Catherine. Marcus had bought Catherine a New Year's Eve gift, some diamond earrings. Well, Nicole got jealous because when we got home, she wanted to know where her diamond earrings were. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Nicole said, Catherine told me you bought earrings just like the ones Catherine was wearing. Where are they? If you didn't get them for me, who'd you get them for? I said, you're crazy. I didn't get nobody no damn earrings. Nicole tried to hit me, 
I grabbed her arm and dragged her out of our bedroom. I pushed her in the hallway and locked the door. She was banging on the door, hollering at me, but I ignored her. She finally stopped, but that was only because she went to get the key. Then she attacked me, fists and feet like usual, so I grabbed her and threw her out again, but I kept the key this time. I went to bed. I was dozing when someone knocked on my door. It was the housekeeper, Michelle. She told me through the door that the police were there. I thought, the police? What the hell? I went outside, and Nicole was sitting in the back of the squad car. You've probably seen the pictures of her, but it was three in the morning. She had been drinking and crying, under fluorescent light with no makeup. How do you think she's going to look? At the hospital, doctors noted that she had bruises on her face and arms. I put the bruises on her arms when I grabbed her, but I didn't punch her in the face. She might have done that to herself when she was wrestling with me. Nicole came home that morning and said, Leave me alone. I'm sick of this. I was sick of it too. We tiptoed around each other for a few days, but I figured it would eventually blow over. A detective came by and asked me some follow-up questions. After that, I figured it was over. Then, a month later, I see the whole ugly incident on the Herald Examiner. I was shocked. Nicole was too. They used Nicole's testimony and those photographs they took at the hospital to charge me with domestic abuse. I was convicted of spousal abuse, put on probation, given a fine and community service. I was a convicted wife beater. Can you believe that? I did drag Nicole from our bedroom, but I didn't beat her. If Nicole were still alive, she'd say the same thing. For the next few days, I thought everything was fine, but I was oblivious. Maybe I was working too much. In January of 1992, Nicole told me that she wanted to separate. I thought she was having an affair, but she denied it. She didn't want to get the lawyers involved. She just wanted to take a break for a month. She suggested I move out of the Rockingham house. She talked about how she'd been with me her whole adult life and that she felt like she was living under my shadow. She said she needed to find herself or some shit. I was like, fine, we can separate, but I'm not doing it without the lawyers, and I'm not moving out. I bought this house before I even met you. So Nicole moved to a rented house about eight minutes away. Most of Nicole's family and friends were surprised by our separation, except for Nicole's best friend, Cora, who knew about Nicole's affair. It wasn't someone she was serious about, but it happened, although Nicole never admitted it. Nicole asked a guy she had met skiing in Aspen to help her with chores, errands, and babysitting. In return, he got to live rent-free in the guest house. That was Cato Kalin. Despite our separation, we ended up in bed on occasion. Nicole usually cried afterward. It was really weird. Nicole was going out on dates with guys and she'd be calling me for advice. She was insecure, worried about whether or not she was beautiful or if some guy was going to love her for her. And here I was trying to reassure her, but she's my wife, you know? It was bizarre. To be honest, Nicole sounded like a teenager. And maybe in Dayton years, she was a teenager. After all, we'd been together since she was 18, so she didn't have much time to date. One night in May of 1992, I was out with some friends, and I saw Nicole and some of her friends. One of Nicole's friends made a joke saying to me, Hey, OJ, are you stalking your estranged wife? I smiled and said, Yeah, me and my whole posse. We went our separate ways for the evening. When I was out with the guys... I couldn't stop thinking about Nicole, so at the end of the night, I went by her house. I parked on the street and walked up to the house. The lights were on. I looked in the window, and I saw Nicole on the couch with her supposed friend, Keith. They were going at it pretty hot and heavy. I banged on the front door hard to let them know that they'd been seen. I went home alone, but I was pissed. The next day, I talked to Nicole about it. I said, it's your business what you do, but the kids were in the house. It's not cool if they would have walked in on that shit. She was apologetic, making excuses about drinking too much and telling me that Keith was just a friend and it wasn't supposed to happen. I was still pissed. Shit like that doesn't just happen. I hadn't had sex in months and Nicole was running around town dating different men. It made me sick. A few weeks later, Nicole went to Cabo San Lucas when she got back, she told me, I met someone, a guy I'm pretty crazy about. I told her that we should let the lawyers handle the divorce, and we should do it quickly and amicably. At first, 
I felt sad. I really thought we were going to patch things up. But then I felt relieved. I didn't have to try to be the good, estranged husband. I could move on. The next night, I was at an L.A. club, and I saw a Hawaiian Tropic model I knew. She had heard about my separation from Nicole, and she was real sorry about that. Not so sorry, though, because we went out to dinner. Then she came over to the house. I thought, O.J. is coming out tonight. But it wasn't the Hawaiian Tropic model who I really liked. It was another model I met through my friend Marcus Allen. Her name was Paula Barbieri. She was fun and beautiful and easy to be with. She wasn't so combative like Nicole. During this time, Nicole was calling me constantly. It was obsessive. She would start with something about the kids, but really she wanted to talk about her personal problems. I would take her calls and try to help her, but she really wasn't my responsibility anymore. On one of these phone calls, she told me that she was pregnant. I asked if the father was the guy she met in Cabo. She said it was another guy. Then she told me she was going to get an abortion. What the hell am I supposed to say to that? I guess she did because there wasn't a baby. In October of 1992, our divorce was final. Only months after our divorce, Nicole was hinting around about getting back together, but I wasn't interested. Nicole started sending cakes and cookies with the kids, and they'd say, Mom made these for you. One time, the kids showed up with a CD for me filled with love songs. Finally, she tried a grand gesture with a package for me with our wedding tape inside and a letter. In the letter, she took responsibility for all her craziness. She ended the letter with this. OJ, you'll be my one and only true love. I'm sorry for the pain I've caused you, and I'm sorry we let it die. Please let us be a family again, and let me love you better than I ever have before. I love you forever and always. I tried to avoid Nicole because I didn't want to get back together. I was happy with Paula. One of my friends had died, and I ran into Nicole at the funeral home. We ended up going to a restaurant in Santa Monica. Nicole started talking about my friend Marcus Allen and his fiancée, Catherine. They had asked me to host their upcoming wedding at my Rockingham house, and I had agreed. I talked about how nice Catherine was and how she reminded me of Nicole. Then, Nicole started crying for no reason. I said, What's wrong? I wasn't trying to upset you. She said, That's not it. Then what? I asked. Marcus is not your friend, she replied. Then she told me about how she'd slept with my friend right before his marriage at my house. What the hell was I supposed to do with that? Well, Nicole was asking me what to do about it. I told her to tell Marcus if he doesn't leave her alone, she'll tell Catherine. I figured that would cool him off real quick. What a mess. And I couldn't cancel the wedding at my house. It was too late for that. I figured Nicole and Marcus were technically single at the time, so it's none of my business. Anyway, Nicole was a mess after telling me. She wanted to come home with me and to be with the kids. We fell asleep with the kids in between us. Then the next thing I knew, Nicole was pulling my arm and leading me to my bedroom. And before I knew it, we were making love. It was all so confusing. I cheated on my girlfriend with my ex-wife, and I felt terrible about it. I didn't tell Paula, and I didn't have any intention of getting back together with Nicole. But Nicole started stalking me. She would drive by the house late at night, and if Paula's truck wasn't there, she'd ring the doorbell. Before I knew it, we were sleeping together two or three times a week. Nicole wanted to get back together, but I didn't want that. Like I said, it was all so confusing. Nicole was in therapy, and she told me that her therapist thought she had an anger problem and that she tried to create drama because it made her feel alive. Of course, I already knew that about Nicole. She was always fighting with someone, a bouncer at a club, a friend, some jerk at the gym. I was glad she was getting help for her issues. I went to Cabo twice with Nicole behind Paula's back. We spent time with the kids as a family. Things were going really well with Nicole. I was falling in love with her all over again. I finally agreed to give it another try, but I didn't want her moving back into my house with the kids in case it didn't work out. I didn't want the kids to have their lives disrupted again. So we agreed to be together for a year, but we would still live apart. Then, if it worked after a year, we'd remarry and we'd move back in together. I told Paula that I was going back to Nicole. Paula was disappointed. She said, don't expect me to wait for you. 
there were problems with Nicole right away. We started bickering like old times. Nicole was spending a lot of time with her so-called friends. I have to be honest, I didn't like them. They were a bunch of losers and druggies into all sorts of shady stuff. One of Nicole's friends was Brett Cantor, a waiter in Brentwood. He was knifed to death that summer of 1993. The police never solved that case, but I heard rumors that Brett's killing was drug-related. I didn't like Nicole being around these losers, and I certainly didn't want my kids around him. But Nicole continued to see him, despite my complaints. I was happy to be working on the Naked Gun sequel, as it got me away from Nicole and her craziness. While on set, I ran into a girl who was a stand-in for Anna Nicole Smith. She told me about some wild parties she'd been to recently, and she had seen Nicole and her friends there often. This woman described Nicole's friends as a pretty rough crowd. This woman was actually a part-time hooker. She worked with the Hollywood madam, Heidi Fleiss, and this hooker was telling me that my wife was running around with a rough crowd. I was pissed. Nicole and I had a big fight about it, but Nicole kept saying they were her friends and they were nice people. I said, nice people don't go around getting themselves knifed to death. Nice people don't do hard drugs. Nice people don't turn into whores. The fight escalated and Nicole ended up locking herself in the bathroom and calling the police. I had every right to be pissed. Nicole had drug addicts and hookers hanging around my kids. I didn't touch Nicole, so thankfully, they didn't arrest me. The next day, I was back on set for the naked gun, and Nicole called me to see how I was doing. She acted like nothing happened, like she hadn't called the police on me for no damn reason the night before. Nicole continued to hang out with her druggy friends. Some of her close friends wanted me to intervene. Nicole started to look like she was doing drugs too, all sickly and shit. I tried to intervene, but what could I do? Nicole wouldn't listen to me. She denied doing drugs, but I think she was lying. Nicole wasn't just arguing with me either. She was constantly picking on my housekeeper, Michelle. Michelle was a lovely woman, never did nothing to nobody. But Nicole didn't like her for some reason. Nicole was constantly telling me to fire Michelle, but I wasn't going to do that. Who I hire and fire is my business. Then, in March of 1994, it got so bad between Nicole and Michelle that Nicole hit the poor woman. Can you believe that? Nicole actually hit Michelle. I had to beg Michelle not to call the cops. Michelle ended up quitting. I felt so bad I gave her severance for as long as she needed. At this time, I was filming a television pilot called Frogmen. I was playing a former Navy SEAL. For the role, the studio hired experts to teach us combat techniques, including knife fighting. After Nicole and Ron were murdered, people made a big deal about this. But I'm an actor. It was just a part. When Mother's Day of 1994 rolled around, our year-long trial was finally up, and I was done with Nicole. I was ready for it to be over, for good. I told Nicole it was over. She was sad. She said she should have worked on herself a little more before asking me to try again. We made love after we broke up, knowing it would be the last time. I ended up getting back together with Paula. I was happy that she took me back after everything I put her through. Two weeks before Nicole's death, her best friend Cora contacted me wanting to talk. Cora lived nearby, so she came over. Cora begged me to do something about Nicole. She said, You've got to get her away from these people. I told Cora. I tried, but Nicole doesn't listen to me. Then Cora said something that I still think about to this day. She said, Nicole just refuses to accept that she's in serious trouble, and in my heart, I know something bad is going to happen. I told Cora to talk to Nicole's mother, because Nicole wasn't my problem anymore. After the murders, I felt bad for not trying to help. June 12th, 1994 was the night it happened. Earlier in the day, my daughter Sydney had a dance recital at her school. When I got to the recital, I saw Nicole and her parents and her sister. Nicole wore a very short skirt that looked inappropriate for even a teenager. She looked ridiculous. At the intermission, I saw Cora's husband, Ronald Fishman. He filled me in on what Nicole and her girlfriends had been doing. Apparently, they were out of control with the drugs and the partying. Ronald and Cora had split over it. In reference to Cora and Nicole, Ronald said, I'm sure we don't know the half of it. We don't know the half of it. That stuck with me. That really bothered me. After Sydney's recital, 
the Brown family went out to dinner. I told them I wasn't going to dinner and that I needed to stay away from Nicole because we weren't getting along. During the trial, the prosecution acted like I was angry that I wasn't invited to dinner. But I didn't want to go, and if I wanted to go, I could have. When I got home, I saw Cato Kalin. He had moved into my guest house when Nicole moved to her condo and didn't have room for him. We talked for a few minutes. Cato showed me a girl in his Playboy magazine, said he knew her, and could hook me up if I wanted. I wasn't interested, but she kind of looked like this Raiders cheerleader I used to know. So I called up this cheerleader and got her machine. I said, hey, it's me, OJ. I wanted to see how you were doing and to tell you that I'm a free man, a totally free man. Technically, I wasn't a free man. I was still seeing Paula, but she was pissed at me because I didn't want her at Sydney's recital. I was trying to be respectful to the Browns. Then I got hungry and went to McDonald's with Cato. As I was eating, I didn't talk much. I thought about Nicole and how she'd been treating me. The last few times I called Nicole to spend time with my kids, she made it difficult for me. There was always some excuse why I couldn't see my kids. They were tired, they just ate. I didn't understand it. It was like she didn't want me to see my own kids. Nicole wasn't the same person I fell in love with. She was a complete stranger to me. When I got back from McDonald's, I started packing. I had a late flight that night to Chicago for a meeting with the Hertz people. After packing, I chipped a few golf balls into my neighbor's yard. Usually golf calms me, but I couldn't stop thinking about Nicole. I thought, that woman is going to be the death of me. It was about 9.30 then. I found out later that the Browns ate at Mezzaluna, an Italian restaurant in Brentwood. Nicole's mother had left her glasses at the restaurant. Nicole called the restaurant and they said that Ron Goldman, a waiter, would drop them off at Nicole's house after a shift. I tried calling Paula on my cell, but she wasn't picking up. She was still pissed about not being invited to the recital. I was trying to do the right thing, but it doesn't pay to do the right thing if you're doing it for people who don't give a shit about you. All of a sudden, I felt exhausted. I was getting old. I could barely walk with my aching knees. I had arthritis in my hands too. I sat on a low wall near my front door. I was feeling whipped by life. I used to be somebody, but now I was tired. Nicole beating me down. I was so damn tired. I thought about the time I caught Nicole going at it on the couch with her friend Keith, with my kids in the house made my stomach turn. I heard Ronald Fishman's words. We don't know the half of it. Nicole was on her way to hell and she was taking me and the kids with her. I checked my watch. It was 10.03. I needed to take a shower and get ready to catch my flight. From this point forward, this is all hypothetical. I hate to say this, but this is hypothetical. I'm right. sorry. Then a car I didn't know slowed by my gate. The driver walked up to my gate and waved. It was Charlie, a guy I met a few weeks ago. I won't give you his real name. Charlie. <laughs> I liked Charlie. He was always happy. I told him to stop by if he was ever in my neighborhood. I figured that's what he was doing. But it wasn't a happy visit. Charlie told me about what he heard about Nicole and her friend and what they had done in Cabo a few months back. He said, there was a lot of drugs and a lot of drinking and apparently things got pretty kinky. I was so sick of hearing this shit. I told Charlie to come with me. Charlie asked, where, where are we going? I said, we're going to scare the shit out that girl. Charlie tried to talk me out of it, but I was in a frenzy. I shouldn't have told you, Charlie said. No, you did the right thing. This shit's been eating away at me forever, and it's got to stop. And I remember thinking, well, whatever's going over there has got to stop. We went to Nicole's condo. I parked in an alley behind her house but I parked down a ways, so I wasn't right behind her condo. I remember it was so quiet. Charlie wanted to leave. He asked, what if she's with someone? She better not be, I said, not with my kids in the house. I reached into the back of my Ford Bronco for the wool cap and gloves that I used for the golf course when it was cool in the morning. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Charlie was alarmed, telling me that I looked like a burglar. I grabbed my knife from under the seat and said, good. Charlie took the knife from me and said, go talk to your girl if you have to, but you're not taking that knife with you. Nicole's back gate was supposed to be locked, but the lock was broken. 
I entered the backyard and slipped into the skinny courtyard and crept toward the front. Flickering lights and soft music came from Nicole's condo. She was expecting one of her boyfriends. Nicole and some guy were going to get all nasty while my kids were upstairs asleep. I was furious at this point. That's when the back gate squeaked. I turned around and saw a guy walking in the yard like he owned the effing place. I didn't recognize him, but he was a good looking guy with dark hair. A, a, a guy I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. I didn't know it then, but he was Ron Goldman. When Ron saw me, he froze. In the mood I was in, I started having words with him. I said, who the hell are you? He was stuttering and shit, telling me some bullshit about returning a pair of glasses. He told me that he was a waiter and Judy left him at the restaurant. This pissed me off. Judy was Nicole's mother. Why was this guy on a first name basis with her? Charlie came up behind us, blocking Ron. He was carrying my knife. I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one to make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. Ron and I argued some more. I called him an effing liar. I told him that Nicole had candles burning for him in the house. Ron said that the candles weren't for him. Then Nicole came outside. She was wearing a slinky little black dress, probably nothing on underneath. Nicole was like, OJ, what the hell is going on? That's what I want to know, I replied. Then Nicole's dog came outside, wagging his tail at Ron. I started interrogating Ron again, accusing him of dealing drugs to Nicole. He denied everything, and Nicole got pissed. She attacked me, arms and legs flailing. I avoided her, and she slipped and hit her head on the ground. She was laying there, not moving. I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. Charlie was freaked out. He was like, let's get the hell out of here. I glared at Ron and he got into his little karate stance. I was like, you think you can take me with your karate shit? This guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? He was circling me, bobbing and weaving. If I wasn't so pissed, I would have laughed in his face. Charlie was trying to get me to leave. I noticed the knife in Charlie's hand and in one quick move, I took it. And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. I looked at Ron and said, you think you're tough, mother effer? Then something went terribly wrong. I know what happened, but I can't tell you how. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around and, um, um. I was standing in Nicole's yard, listening to my own heartbeat pounding. My shirt was wet. I looked down. I was covered in blood. Nicole was on the ground in front of me in the fetal position. Ron was slumped against the fence. They were both lying in massive pools of blood. I've never seen so much blood. I wondered what the hell happened. Then I noticed the blood-soaked knife in my hand. My right hand, wrist, and halfway up my forearm was covered in blood. Charlie said, Jesus Christ, OJ, what have you done? I didn't know what he was talking about. I hadn't done anything. We got the hell out of there, though. I hate to say this, but this is like, that, I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. <laughs> it's okay. According to the L.A. coroner, Ron Goldman was stabbed multiple times with injuries to his neck, face, ears, chest, thighs, hands, forearm, and abdominal area. Ron Goldman had fatal wounds to a major neck vein, his lung, and severe abdominal bleeding. Goldman had dozens of defensive wounds, suggesting he fought very hard for his life. From what I could find, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown were platonic friends who had only known each other for six weeks. Nicole Brown was stabbed seven times in the scalp and neck. Defensive wounds on her hands suggested that she fought for her life. She suffered a gruesome gash across her throat, almost six inches long. The cut severed the carotid arteries on both sides of her neck, as well as her jugular veins. It was so deep that the knife nicked one of her vertebrae. During the trial, the medical examiner testified that Nicole's face was smashed into a wall. She was face down on the ground when her killer likely delivered the fatal neck wound by grabbing her hair and slicing her neck. Nicole Brown likely died minutes afterward, going into rapid shock. Detective Tom Lang testified that Nicole Brown was likely killed before Ron Goldman, citing the lack of blood on the bottoms of her feet. O.J. Simpson's trial was a media and cultural lightning rod heavily divided by race. 
In a 1994 poll, 22% of black respondents believed OJ was guilty, while 63% of white respondents believed he was guilty. OJ's reputation has deteriorated over the years. A 2016 poll showed that 57% of black respondents and 83% of white respondents believed OJ was guilty. Many Americans watched OJ's verdict in real time. Footage showed the dramatic disparity in the reactions between white viewers and black viewers, perfectly illustrating the deep racial divisions in America. Despite overwhelming DNA evidence, OJ was acquitted. Why? In 1995, DNA evidence was a brand new science. It's possible that the jury didn't fully understand the importance and infallibility of DNA. If OJ Simpson were tried today, the DNA evidence against him would be more than sufficient to merit a conviction. The blood found near Nicole and Ron's bodies was likely to be OJ Simpson's blood. There is a 1 in 170 million chance that that blood was someone else's. Nicole's blood was likely found on OJ's sock. There is a 1 in 21 billion chance that it was someone else's blood. The blood found inside OJ's Ford Bronco was similarly matched to Nicole and Ron Goldman. There was never any evidence to support the existence of an accomplice. Charlie. <laughs> the DNA evidence being too new might not have had anything to do with OJ's acquittal. A former juror on the OJ trial had this to say 26 years after that not guilty verdict. Do you think that they're members of the jury? that voted to acquit O.J. because of Rodney King? Yes. You do? Yes. How many of you think felt that way? Oh, probably 90% of them. O.J. Simpson died on April 10th, 2024, of cancer, at the ripe old age of 76. Ron Goldman was only 25, and Nicole Brown was only 35 when they were murdered. In the wake of O.J.'s death, David Zucker, who directed O.J. in The Naked Gun, wrote, his acting was a lot like his murdering. He got away with it, but no one believed him. If O.J. was still with us, I think this is what he'd say about the murders. Did not do it. No, I didn't. Nope, did not do it. Thank you so much for watching and listening to Thriller Vault. If you enjoyed this story, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I hope to see you all next week for another thriller story.